Okay, so this is the video for Unit 9. Here we're going to be looking at electrochemistry. Why is this? There we go. Now, this unit is one of the most interesting because it has to do with more everyday things than we really uh, recognize at first. And it's because this is the basis of batteries, this is the basis of electricity in general. And so we're going to look at what it means to be a voltaic cell, how batteries really work. We're going to look at standard reduction potentials and how to use them in looking at when or if something is going to oxidize or reduce. We're going to use the Nernst equation. We're going to look at the cell voltage and we're going to evaluate um, redox reactions here. We're also going to look at electrical energy. So we're going to start off with balancing redox reactions because that is the most important portion of this. Then we'll get into the cells and how to use the reduction potentials themselves. So when we talk about this unit, we have to remember what it really means to be electrochemical. And electrochemistry is just when we study how chemical energy gets transformed into electrical energy and how much of that we can end up getting. If you remember back to 111, uh, redox reactions are just those that involve electrons transferring from one substance to another. And then um, we typically can define oxidation reduction more than one way. Oxidation is either the loss of electrons or it's even sometimes just gaining bonds to oxygen. Reduction is a gain of electrons uh, or a loss of bonds to uh, oxygen. And then we have a reducing agent and oxidizing agent. And remember these are kind of like opposite concepts. If you're being oxidized in the reaction, meaning you're losing electrons, you're forcing someone else to become reduced. So whoever is being oxidized, whatever reactant is being oxidized in the reaction is the reducing agent because it is forcing through that loss of electrons for someone else to gain them. So it's donating electrons, whatever reactant is being oxidized is the reducing agent. Similarly, whatever thing is being reduced in the reaction, whatever reactant is going to be reduced in the reaction, gained electrons, and so it's the oxidizing acceptor. It's allowing electrons to come in from someone else. There we go. So the overall reaction here is usually going to be split in half. I don't know why my arrow isn't here, but it should be right there. Um, now the idea is if I gave you a reaction like this, eight hydrogens plus the manganate ion plus five iron twos going to manganese two plus plus five iron threes plus water, you, it would be really hard for you to balance this, okay? And so what we typically do is we split the reaction up into two half reactions. And so we take the substances like manganate and manganese that have this uh, that have the same core element and here we've got iron and iron and we can really look at the reduction reaction and the oxidation reaction. We call this the reduction reaction because it's got electrons on the reactant side. This is the oxidation react, uh, reaction because it's got electrons being lost. It's on the product side. It's going away. Okay. Now if you notice, the electrons are the same being gained and being lost. You can't have a different number or you're violating the law of conservation of mass here. And so we have to have that same number. But if I were to give you an unbalanced redox reaction, there's you have to go through a series of steps to balance it. You can't just kind of, how do you know there's five irons here? So let's look at the steps. Okay, there we go. So the first thing you're going to do is when you get an unbalanced redox reaction is you're going to split it up according to those core elements. You know, for the last reaction it was uh, manganese and iron and that's going to be all you take. Now for each half reaction you're going to balance them following these steps. 
you're going to balance everything except hydrogen and oxygen. So you make sure you have the same number of manganese, the same number of irons, that sort of thing. Then you're going to balance the oxygen by adding water to the side that needs oxygen. You can't just add a random oxygen because, well, for a series of reasons. Primarily, oxygen has unpaired electrons, and it's like the end of the world if you do that. So instead, we add water. Then you're going to balance hydrogen to the, to the side that needs hydrogen. You're going to add H+. Plus. Once you've done that, you're going to look at the charges, and you're going to balance the charges. So you're going to add up the charge of everything on one side, the charge of everything on the other, and whichever side is higher, you're going to add electrons to to kind of bring it down to the same number. If you have a different number of electrons that are involved in the two half reactions, you may have to multiply to get those numbers the same. You want the same number of electrons because otherwise you're not following the law of conservation of matter. Okay. Once you've got the same number of electrons, you're going to add up the half reactions, cancel anything that's the same on both sides, and then you're just going to double check that everything's balanced. So here's kind of a flow chart of everything I just said. Um, sometimes it's easier to see it this way, but let's go ahead and do one. So here's a good example of a, a redox reaction. Um, and so we've got dichromate reacting with sulfite to produce chromium 3 plus and sulfate. Now, if I asked you to balance this, you can't just go through and say, oh, well, you need a dichromate. You have to actually follow through the steps. So we're going to split this into the two half reactions. Now, the easiest way for me to do this is just to go ahead and um, type it all out. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. So I know I want to split this according to the core elements. So I'm going to take anything that has chromium and put it into a, a reaction. And I'm going to do my things in a second. Now this, because we want um, dichromate and chromium-3 to be in this, um, the same half reaction, I'm going to go ahead and insert my arrow. And I'm going to put my chromium-3 here. Now for the other half reaction, and if I was a really good girl, I'd probably put my aqueouses here as well, but because everything is aqueous, I'm not going to worry about it at the moment. For my other half reaction, I'm going to take the core element, which is sulfur, and I'm going to put those things in a half reaction. There we go. So now I've got my sulfate, I've got my sulfite, and we can look at this. So the first thing we need to do, according to this flow chart, is to balance everything except hydrogen or oxygen. So that means here we need to make sure we have the same number of chromiums, same number of sulfurs. I have two chromiums on this side, so I need to have two chromiums in this side. So I'm going to go ahead and add a two here. Down here I have one sulfur, one sulfur, no problem. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to balance oxygen by adding water. There we go. So here I've got seven oxygens. So I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to do my, my new change in, oh wow, those are new colors, yay updates, plus 7 H2O. Now I have 7 oxygens over here, 7 oxygens over here. 
down here I have four oxygens and three oxygens, so I need to add a water here. All right, so three plus one is four, and then I have four over here, so I'm good. Now, the next thing is we're gonna balance hydrogen by adding H plus. I have seven times two is 14 waters here. I mean, sorry, no. Seven times two is 14 hydrogens right here. So let's go ahead and add in 14. Let's go with pink. Right there. Now here I only have two hydrogens on this side, so I'm going to add two hydrogens over here. There we go. Now at this point we need to start evaluating uh, the charges. Now this is probably the hardest part of all this because you really have to consider every species and so on. And so what I'm going to do is underneath, I'm going to go ahead and write these uh, on each side of the arrow just so we can kind of follow, okay? So on the left, let's go with orange, why not? I have one dichromate that has a two minus charge. And I have 14 hydrogens that have a plus one charge. So if we do the math here, we have two minus, and honestly you could enter it in your calculator just like this, um, but you end up getting two minus and 14, or overall uh, 12, plus 12, either way you want to do it. I'm going to go ahead and include my plus just to make sure I don't forget it, okay? Now on the right, if we look here, I've got two chromiums with a three plus charge. And then I've got seven waters with no charge. So if you want, you could even write, you know, that, that in to make sure you're not forgetting something. So this is going to end up being plus 6. So you can kind of see plus 12 plus 6 is not the same. Now the way that we balance charges is by adding in electrons. And so we're going to add electrons to the side that is more positive. This is higher by 12, uh, plus 12 is higher than 6 by 6. So in order to, to balance this, we're going to add in 6 negatively charged electrons. Okay, now we can take that six and include it in our charges and we end up getting plus six on both sides, plus six, plus six. This is now a balanced half reaction. I'm going to get rid of this just for spacing purposes. Actually, I'll just make it small for a second. Okay, now down here if we look, I'm going to do the same thing here that I did before. I'm going to go ahead and use, oops, wrong. The same method. I'm going to use my coefficient and my charge. So on the left, I have one sulfite that has a two minus charge. And I have a water with a zero charge. And I typically write out everything just to make sure I don't forget something. Overall that gives us a minus two total. On the other side, I have a sulfate 
that has a two minus charge. And I have two hydrogens that have a plus one charge. So overall this gives us um, minus two, plus two, zero. Same thing, this is not equal. Minus two, zero, not equal. In order to make these equal, we have to add electrons to the side that's more positive. And so we're going to add two electrons over here. Doing that, we have now zero minus two is equal to minus two, and so our charges are balanced here. Okay, so yay. Now if we look at these, I've got six electrons being gained up here, so this is, they're gaining electrons, so this is my reduction reaction. Down here, the electrons are on the product side, they're being lost, so this is the oxidation half reaction. Okay, now the problem we have is that the top reaction is got six electrons involved. This is two electrons being lost. It's not the same. We need to make these the same. So what we're going to do is multiply this reaction so that we have six electrons total. Okay, um, I, I, you guys are 112. I know you can tell that we're going to multiply by 3. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to multiply this whole thing by 3. And we're going to end up getting 3 times 1 is 3 sulfates. I like it to be the same color. <laughs> there we go. Close enough. Plus one times three is going to be three waters. I think it was that one. Oh, cooperate. And that is going to go to 3 times 1 is going to be 3 sulfates. Three times two is now going to be six hydrogens. Three times two is going to also be six electrons. Oops. Okay. So now we've got our two half reactions. They're completely balanced within themselves. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add these two half reactions together. Okay? And so what that's going to do is everything on the left is going to be on the left. Everything on the right is going to be on the right. Now, usually I try to keep my arrows um, lined up because it does make everything easier. I don't know why. You can either write them off or you can go ahead and cross off what is the same on both sides. I'm going to go ahead and do that because I know it's not going to fit here and I don't want to make a really big mess. So I look for anything that's the same on the left and on the right. We can tell immediately that the electrons are the same. You see why I color coded? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to cross those off the same way we would if we had um, where is the strike through here? There it is. The same way as if we had, uh, you know, pencil and paper or something else. Okay. Let's go ahead and pin this for a second.
Now, the other thing that we can cross off, I have three waters, seven waters. I can't cross off all seven, but I can get rid of at least three. Okay, so I'm going to cross off three here. This, three of those are now gone. Seven minus three is going to be only four left over. Okay, if you want, you can delete it to make it a little easier to see. Um, I just want to make sure you guys can actually follow this. Same thing for our hydrogens. We have 14 and 6, so we know that 6 of them can be crossed off. And this 14 minus the 6 is going to now be 8. And so to get the final balanced reaction, we're just going to add everything that's left. So the left is going to be on the left, the right is going to be on the right, kind of like net ionic equations way back in Unit 7 of 111. So here we have dichromate. Oops. Plus eight hydrogens. Plus three sulfites. goes to the two chromium threes four waters three sulfates um, this one And that's it. That's it. Okay, so now we have our balanced reaction. Just to double check, just like it says here, confirm that everything's balanced. Two chromium, two chromium. Seven oxygens here. Three times three is nine. Seven plus nine is 16. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, here we've got three times four is 12, plus another four, 16. So we're good there. Hydrogens, we have eight. Four times two is eight. So we're good. Three sulfurs, three sulfurs. We're balanced. Um, if you want, you can also check your charges. Here you've got minus two, plus eight, and then uh, three times a negative two is minus six. This ends up actually, it cancels completely. It doesn't always do that. It doesn't really matter as long as it's um, going to be the same on both sides. Here we've got 2 times a 3 plus, which is 6, 0, 3 times a minus 2 is minus 6. Again, 0 and 0 is equal. You will not always have a charge that's going to be 0. They don't always add up to be 0. That's fine. As long as the charge here and the charge here are the same, you're good to go. Okay? So that is how you balance a redox reaction. Um, what is kind of fun about this is it's really just a process. As long as you go through that chart, you're going to be okay. Um, the big point here is make sure you follow those steps. And so if I were to ask, you know, how many electrons are transferred in this reaction and you only worked the, t the first half reaction, you might say six. Well, it's not. Um, or I'm sorry, if you only worked this one, you might say two. It's not two, it's actually six. So you want to make sure that you work both to know that what the real number of electrons is, okay? And we did this. So let's look at this one. This is a little bit more uh, fun, I guess. I think it's fun. Um, and this is a better indication of what I mean by the other. So go ahead and hit pause, try to solve this on your own, and then I'm going to do it here anyway. Oops, there we go. Get rid of that. Actually, we'll just move it down. All right, so to balance our half reactions, um, what we're going to do is we're going to split these based on core elements. So that for us, that's going to be bromine and manganese. So I'm going to have one half reaction that is Br minus. 
And again, if I was a good girl, I'd write the aqueous, but it's going to take up too much room here. On the other side, I'm going to have my BR2. Oops, there we go. Okay, for the second re reaction, we're going to split manganese containing um, substances. So that's going to be the manganate ion and the manganese 2. It's got a 1 minus charge. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and say, make it all the same size, make it all the same color, like that. A little bit easier to see. Now, first thing we need to do is balance things that are not uh, hydrogen and oxygen. I'm going to make a space here just to make that a little easier to see. We can tell on the top we have one bromine here, two bromines on this side. So we're going to add a two. Down, that's not an easy color to see. Down here, I've got one manganese, one manganese. Good deal. Um, so now we're going to balance our oxygens by adding water. No oxygen up here. We only have to worry about it down here. So here we're going to balance our oxygens by adding in four waters. So now I've got four oxygens, four oxygens. Now we're going to balance our hydrogens by adding in H+. No hydrogens up here. We have eight on this side, so we need eight on this side. I did pink, I think, for those. Okay, so now our hydrogens are balanced. Last thing we need to check is our charges. So let's go ahead and evaluate our charges here. In this reaction, we have two bromides. It should be one minus because that's how we write charges. Is equal to negative two on this side. On the right, we have one bromine that has a zero charge. Obviously, these are not equal. So what we're going to do is we're going to add electrons to the side that's more positive. And we're going to end up adding two electrons. Oops, superscript. So now we've got that. Oops, equals minus two. And our charges here are balanced. For this one, we are going to do the same thing. Let's evaluate our charges. On this side, I have the manganate ion that has a one minus charge. I have eight hydrogens that each have a one plus charge. So in your calculator, you have a minus one plus eight gives you plus seven, okay? Now, on the other side, we have the manganese ion. So there's one of those. It's got a two plus charge. And we have four waters that have a zero charge. And so we end up having um, plus two total. Same thing here. We need to add electrons to the side that's more positive to make sure that we end up getting uh, a balanced charge. That just ensures that our electrons are going to be the same on each side, okay? So here we're going to add five electrons. So seven minus five is plus two. Plus two, plus two, these are the same. So that's all that matters. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the charges. Um, now that we have it, just so that it makes everything a little easier to see when I add these up, okay? 
Now, at this point, we need to add our two half reactions. I'm going to try and keep my arrows as lined up as possible. Make this underlined. And let's evaluate what is uh, the same. Okay. Actually, can we do that yet? Hopefully you're going, no, no, wait a minute. Problem we have, two electrons, five electrons, not the same. So we actually need to do one more step first, and that is to make the five and the two equal. Lowest common denominator here is going to be 10. So we're going to multiply this entire thing by five to get to 10 electrons. We're going to multiply this entire reaction by two to get 10 electrons there. So 5 times 2 is going to be 10 bromines. 5 times 1 is going to be 5 here. 5 times 2 is now going to be 10 here. Now down here, 2 times 1 is going to be 2. 2 times 8 is now going to be 16. 2 times 5 is going to be 10. 2 times 1 is going to be 2, and 2 times 4 makes this an 8. At this point, 10 electrons, 10 electrons, we can add these two things together, okay? All right, so let's look at what's the same on both sides. We can immediately get rid of the electrons. You should be able to do that. If you don't, um, if you can't, it's because you did something wrong. Now, I don't have any hydrogens on the other side. I don't have any waters to cancel. So we're left with 10 bromides, 16 hydrogens, 2 manganate ions. On the right, we have 5 bromines two manganese, two ions, and eight waters. And so that's our balanced equation. So the same thing I said before, if you don't go through the process and I, the question asks you how many electrons are transferred in this reaction, if you only did the bromines, you might have said two. If you only did this half reaction, you might have said five. The answer is actually 10 though. So you have to make sure you go through the steps to really see that. Now, um, last thing I wanna clarify, just like in the last one, because electrons are lost here, it is the oxidation <laughs> half reaction. Because electrons are gained in this one, this is the reduction half reaction. In addition, um, we could also talk about because this is being oxidized, bromide is being oxidized, it is our reducing agent. Because manganese is being reduced, it is our oxidizing agent, okay? Now, the only other thing we would do different if it was in a basic solution instead of an acidic solution is we would try to cancel our H pluses by adding in hydroxide. And so we could actually take um, the H plus and the hydroxide and you would end up making water and then you could cancel any water you have, okay? And so it would be the same type of process. So here, if we wanted to go ahead and show you what it would look like in a basic solution, we're gonna do the first part just the same. I'm gonna go ahead and uncross this through. Even though it's not really gonna be affected, let's start from there. Okay, so because this is a basic solution, we need to add our hydroxide because hydroxide is what is present in a uh, <laughs> basic solution. There you go. Um, so we have 16. So what we're going to do is we're going to add 16 hydroxides. Oops, let's go ahead and change the color though. Let's go with red. Now what that does is 16 here and 16 here 
it ends up making a total of 16 waters. H and OH form water. So the only difference is now we can actually cross off our waters here. We have 8 and we have 16. Deletes 8 from both sides, we're left with 8. And so our overall reaction here is going to be a little different because we're not going to have H plus in the final balanced equation. Instead, what we're going to have is more of, um, there we go, a neutral or even a basic type thing. So here we are going to have, um, again, cross off anything that's the same on both sides. We still don't have waters um, on the other side, so we're going to be fine. This is all we can cross through. And so we're going to be left with 10 bromides. plus the two uh, manganate ions, plus the eight waters, going to five bromines, and two manganese with the two plus charge. And this would be our balanced equation and basic solution. Okay, it's just that extra step, which may make more sense if you look at the um, flow chart here. You still do everything the same, but anytime you have hydrogen H plus and a basic solution, you just balance it by adding in hydroxides. Okay. Now, once you have the balanced equation, you can actually plug these into a galvanic cell. You can really generate some electricity. Now, technically, you guys have actually done this. You just aren't aware of it. What you kind of have done in the past, though, if you think back to the lab 3 and 111, uh, you made the aluminum and the copper. You mixed everything together, and you actually watched the solid copper form out of that blue solution. It was a blue uh, copper chloride or copper sulfate solution. You added in some aluminum foil, the solution became clear, I mean colorless, and you ended up getting that copper settling to the to the bottom. And the idea is that happens spontaneously to form a charge or to form a current. Um, when you mix it all in the same beaker, that current, you don't really recognize it, it just feels a little warm. But if you split it into two beakers like this, Cont uh, with a wire or uh, some other metal substance, you can actually generate a charge, just like your batteries are doing in your phone. Okay, It is a way of generating a charge, an electrical current. And so what you end up having is the substance that's being oxidized, your reducing agent, is going to be losing electrons, losing them at the anode because that's where oxidation happens. The electrons travel to the cathode where the oxidizing agent will become reduced and you end up getting a buildup of, uh, of uh, metal usually here. So oxidation occurs at the anode. Uh, the way that most people remember this is O and A are both um, vowels, very scientific, O, A, vowels. Reduction occurs at the cathode, R, C are both consonants. And so that's really about as complicated as it gets there. So what you have to have is you have to have a salt bridge. Usually that's going to be soaked in something like sodium chloride, potassium nitrate, some ionic compound with a neutral salt. And that is going to allow the ions to flow back and forth so you don't get like a buildup of a charge. Okay. So that salt bridge, um, to be honest, in lab, depending on what they have this week, you're either going to use a paper towel or you're going to use um, string. Either way, it doesn't really w matter. 
you can use an expensive jello like matrix you can use anything else honestly in all the labs i've done everywhere i've taught the string works just as good at least for a little while you can also use a porous disc but those are kind of expensive and they are usually pretty brittle so they break pretty quick oops this button so a galvanic cell is going to consist of the oxidizing agent in one compartment, the reducing agent in the other. The oxidizing agent is going to pull the electrons to it because it wants to be reduced. The reducing agent is donating those electrons as it becomes oxidized. Now, oh, that's moved over. So you guys probably noticed this, is, this looks a little different than your slides that you have. I changed the... Um, the design because the font was hard to read on the this thing but it moved things over so the cell potential this is a cursive letter E is um, just the electromotive force and what that really tells us is generally uh, for one volt you can well you can calculate the the force but in our terms of units we say that one joule of work per column of charge okay is equal to a volt so this is a pretty typical uh, cell here. We've got zinc on one side, hydrochloric acid on the other. The zinc is going to be oxidized. It's going to be at our anode. So it's going to be donating electrons over to the cathode where you end up forming hydrogen gas or a more reduced substance, OK? So the way that you can depict this is anode, the electrons are leaving, the electrons are being pointed towards the cathode. Um, for some reason we almost always draw them on the left. That's not like written down anywhere that you must, so be careful that you don't assume it. Um, but to be entirely honest, that's how almost all books will do it for you. Okay. Now, um, what this means for us, if this is being oxidized, it means you're going from metal into a plus metal with a positive charge, um, you are going to be basically eroding this metal plate. If we had something like zinc and copper, you would be able to see it a little bit better because the metal here is going to be eroded. You, one at a time, those metal ions are going to fall off that chunk of metal and you're going to form a more concentrated solution. On the other hand, on the other side, you would get a buildup as the cathode reduces these metal ions. They're going to go from a 2 plus to a 0 state, which is just their solid native state. And so you usually see a buildup. This ends up looking furry at the end of um, the reaction. The solution becomes more colorless as the copper leaves the, um, the solution and lands on the, ca the, the metal plate. Watch the gray metal okay. ions in solution. Okay, so now what's going to happen is as you are, uh, what's it called? Let me go ahead and exit this and turn that down for a second because I want to make sure that you're hearing me. There we go. Okay, so at the cathode, what's going to be happening is you end cathode, up having metal, metal ion ions reduced by gaining electrons from electrical current in the plate. electrode. And so you're going to end up metal getting atoms almost deposit like on the cathode as metal ions in solution move toward the cathode and encounter electrons at a time. there. Okay. On the other hand, at the cathode, I mean, that was the cathode at the anode. Come on. Dies to at release the anode, electrons, what's going to happen is the metal ions are going to be removed one at a time. Positively as they charged metal ions enter the surrounding solution. Leave, the, the metal cathode. ions move toward the, the salt this bridge. This metal plate is going to deteriorate. So for us, a galvanic cell is going to have um, the anode and the cathode. We have a table that is going to give the standard reduction potentials. It's always listed as a reduction potential where it is going from a more reduced state to a more oxidized state. I do not expect you guys to 
um, remember this uh, in terms of the numbers. Where did I put that table? Somewhere down here. I know I did. There it is. You're going to get a table. You're never going to try and memorize all these numbers, okay? And so that is um, really kind of a nice thing to about here. Now, in addition, one of the other great things is as we're dealing with a galvanic cell, if you were to reverse the reaction, you reverse the E. It's just a number. You just do it. Um, but no matter what you multiply the half reaction by, the E stays the same. You don't multiply that number, okay? And so it's always going to run spontaneously that gives the more positive value. So the more positive value, the faster it's going to run on its own, or the more likely it's going to run on its own, okay? Now, we could talk about, there's probably three ways to write the math here, um, but I want to show you guys something here. It's if we were to pull up a table, and I mean I can pull it over. And this is just iron plus iron plus an electron going to iron 2. Do 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 do. 0.77 it's right here, of course. So it's right here, iron plus an electron going to iron 2. Um, now, if you look, copper plus two electrons goes to copper. Copper, there we go, um, plus t copper 2 plus two electrons goes to copper. Those numbers are set. They're going to be the same always. Now, if we were to reverse this, just have the arrow copper going to copper 2 plus 2 electrons. All that would change would be this plus 3, 4 would go to a negative 3, 4. It doesn't matter that there's two electrons and only one here. If we were going to balance this, yes, we would have to multiply, but the E's stay the same. It doesn't matter. And so what's really great is if you wanted to find the standard potential for a cell that has iron 3 plus going to iron 2 plus and copper going to copper 2 plus, what you would do is you're just going to say, where is it? Come on. That it's going to be the E, the E of the cell is equal to the cathode minus the number for the anode. It doesn't matter. You don't have to plug in anything else. You don't have to worry about the numbers. All you have to recognize here oops, is that because copper goes to copper 2 plus, 0 to 2 plus oxidation number, this is being oxidized, so it's the, copper is the anode, iron 3 plus to 2 plus, the oxidation state is getting smaller, so this is our reduction, so this is our cathode, you're just going to take the number from that table, where'd it go? The cathode is 0.77, the anode is 0.34. You plug it in, cathode minus anode, 0.77 minus 0.34, you get 0.43. Now, if you want, you can justify that by saying, well, the reverse reaction makes this a negative 0.34. But really, guys, just take the numbers from the table, cathode minus anode, okay? It just makes it easier. I want to show you the justification here. Like, that's why it's a negative 0.34 because it's an oxidation potential, not a reduction potential. But really, if you just want to plug in the potentials from that table, cathode minus anode, OK? Now, if we look at this, we could even consider what is our best oxidizing agent, OK? Now, oxidizing agent means it wants to be reduced. Now, technically, we could really consider this. We know that F 
fluorine with a minus charge can't really be reduced much more than that, so it's not going to be a very good oxidizing agent. On the other hand, chlorine here, Cl going to Cl minus, it wants to do that. It's in group seven. And so we can kind of talk about, well, this would be a great oxidizing agent. It wants to be reduced um, as opposed to something like metals that do not want to be reduced. These would not be good oxidizing agents. In all honesty, I don't really need you to order them. I just want you to be able to tell me these are not good oxidizing agents because metals don't want to gain electrons. This is not a good oxidizing agent because it's already reduced. This is a really good oxidizing agent because it wants to be reduced. And this one is somewhere in the middle because it can be reduced, but metals don't really want electrons, okay? Now, because chemists are lazy, we typically write um, these galvanic cells, the electrochemical cells, in line notation. Apparently it takes an extra, you know, microsecond to write a plus instead of a line. So we typically write lines here. Now, in all honesty, it means the same thing. The difference is we put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. You can kind of think of this in terms of you have to lose the electron, somebody has to give them up before somebody else can gain them. So we put oxidizing on the anode on the left, the cathode, which is going to be reduced on the right. The two half reactions are separated by a single vertical line. The two separate half reactions are separated by a double line. Okay. So here we can tell here ma magnesium going to magnesium 2 plus, 0 to 2 plus. This is being oxidized, so this is our anode, so it should be first. Aluminum 3 plus going to aluminum solid, 3 plus to 0, it's being reduced, so it should be on the right because that's our cathode. And so we could really write this as our anode or oxidizing half reaction, magnesium going to magnesium 2 plus. Only way to do that is to have two electrons. Aluminum going to aluminum 3 plus going to aluminum by, by gaining three electrons. Okay. Now it is usually, it's always going to run where the cell potential is positive. Okay. So in lab, if you experience issues, try reversing your electrodes because it may be negative in one direction going positive in the other. So just reverse them, the red and the black, you know. So now the electron flow is going to go, um, you'll be able to tell based off the color of those electrodes which is going to be your anode and which is going to be your cathode, okay? but it's going to run spontaneously in the direction that gives a positive value. So in general, what you want to do from here is you want to figure out what the anode and cathode are, where is the oxidation happening, which one is the anode, which one is the cathode, and then you want to really write the half reaction by it for each compartment. It's kind of an interesting lab because the numbers work, you usually get about 90% of what is on the standard reduction potential, which is not bad considering that our solutions are pretty dilute and you're only using a couple mils. So. so at some point you're going to want to separate to draw a sketch using the following. You want to have what the potential is, the direction of the flow, um, and here we would have silver electrode and silver solution, copper electrode, and copper solution. Go ahead and hit pause here and go ahead and try and draw that and then I'm going to show you how I would consider this. I'm going to move all this over. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, so I'm going to assume you've done this and I'm going to go ahead and look at what those potentials are. Again, I'm looking for silver to silver one and copper to copper two. So copper to copper 2, this is 0.16. No, I'm sorry, that's wrong. This is 0.34. It's right there. Silver plus to silver is 0.8. Now remember, we want it to be positive, okay? So this is only going to run in the direction that is going to be 
positive. So if we have E is equal to the E of the cathode minus the E of the anode, we can plug in those numbers and immediately see what it is. So here, let's just plug in 0.34 minus 0.8. That's not going to give us a positive number. Um, what is it, 0.46? Yeah, 0.46, negative 0.46. If we did it the other way, 0.8 minus 0.34, you end up getting a positive um, just double checking. So we know that this has to be the right situation because that's where we're going to get a positive value. So the 0.8 must be at the cathode. And I think your reading gives you a better way of kind of thinking about this. More positive has to go to the cathode. More negative has to go to the anode because that's going to give you the most positive overall. But if you're not sure, just plug it in both ways you want it to be positive overall. So our 0.8 is our cathode. And so if we go back here for a second, 0.8 was this, the silver. So this is our cathode. It's going to be reducing. It's going to be silver plus going to uh, silver. And so we could even write this. Anode comes first, remember. So we're going to look at copper and copper 2 plus. At, ox at the anode, we have oxidation happening. So we're going to have copper. How do you draw a line? I'm going to use an eye. Yeah. Going to copper 2 plus. And then at the cathode, we're going to have silver plus being reduced. to silver. Okay? So we have our anode, we have our cathode, and we could really just go ahead and draw this. And so I'm going to try my best here. Actually, let's go with no fill. put silver on this side because that's our, um, oops, silver is our cathode, so it's going to go over here. We need copper at our anode. We also need our solutions. Copper tends to be a blue solution, although I don't really expect um, kind of like that. Silver solution over here. And we're going to change the shape color to this gradient to make our solution. And I'm sure your artwork is much better than mine. Last thing we need are some lines separating these two. First things first. So now we have our electrons being transferred. And then we also need a little salt bridge. Hmm. I'm going to go ahead and do it like this. Is 
sometimes easier to do it on real paper, but this will work. And then we are going to kind of like that. Okay, so now I'm just going to label everything that we have. We know this is our anode because this is where oxidation is happening. Here we've got a copper 2 plus solution. This is our copper metal electrode. We've got electrons going up here. Let's go ahead and move this up. And they're going there we go, this way, okay? So over here we know we have our uh, silver solution. We have up here our silver metal. And then this is our salt bridge. Kind of like that and over here we have our cathode. And if you wanted you could also um, take the time to write copper going to copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons over here silver plus plus an electron going to silver metal but this is more than what this is really all that you have to be able to do okay same thing here zinc and copper if you do this correctly, you should look and see. Zinc is almost always going to be your cathode, guys. Um, it's kind of hard to tell why that is. Um, and it's just that, oops, that's not what I meant to do. There we go. But if you look at zinc, because zinc is... Um, It's really hard to, it's cutting this off. Because zinc is right here, it ends up being really negative. So it's almost always the most negative of the other options. So it's usually going to be the, the, the anode. Um, but you could plug it in and find out. Zinc is your anode, copper is going to be your cathode. And so really, copper would be here, zinc would be here and everything else would be the same. Okay, now the only thing that can really help you to have a higher potential, uh, meaning like more voltage going from one to the other, is to increase your concentration. And that's because if you have more things that can react, the more reaction can happen, the more potential is going to occur, okay? Now, work is going to be maximized, um, really not when current is flowing, but later. And so the idea is you always have energy that's wasted. Uh, just think about, you know, your house or, you know, even your body in the cold temperatures. You know, it. you have some that is being lost just to maintain the, the situation. And so the work is always going to be less than the maximum that you get. So when you calculate these things, just kind of keep in mind that's what it should be in theory. It's, it's not really what's happening. So the maximum cell potential that you could get, the, the really the best you could do, is going to be equal to the moles times the potential times the uh, free energy here, okay? 
And so F is always equal to 96,485 columns per mole of electrons, um, which will cancel out moles. And then you're left with um, columns uh, and your potential. So if you look at something like this, where you have a concentration cell, you've got one molar um, here, 0.1 molar here, and all you're doing is going between the same element, you can really consider the equilibrium versus the potential through the Nernst equation. That's how these two things are going to react, uh, relate, relate. Um, and so this, the <laughs> the equation is the potential of the cell is equal to the standard reduction potential minus this constant times the log of Q. At equilibrium, because no energy, no electricity is flowing, it's just the 0.0591 over N times K because you're at equilibrium, not some situation. Okay. Now, remember in general, um, E and E0, we typically use them uh, interchangeably. The difference is E is the potential at any given situation, uh, where E standard, this uh, degree sign indicates standard, meaning you're at one molar concentration or one atmosphere's standard temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. We typically use them interchangeably, but that's really the only difference. And the only time you get E is equal to zero is when you're at equilibrium. At that point, you have what's called a dead battery. There's no, because you have electricity flowing in both directions, there's no net charge going forward. It's kind of like your cell phone battery, when it's dead, the electrons are still transferring. It's just that you have one going one way, one going the other, as opposed to, as opposed to, um, a net flow in one direction. Okay, so what ends up happening is if you have a, come on, there it goes, concentration cell and you've got nickel with concentrations of one molar and one to the negative, one times ten to the negative fourth molar, you can calculate the potential at 25 degrees Celsius. And really what's great about this is because we have the standard conditions we can kind of plug in. And that's, um, so if you look at the last slide, there we go, we have the 0 0.0591 0 over N times the log. And so we can really look, there we go, at this. And so if we just plug in at equilibrium, going back and forth, it's going to be zero plus that 0 0.0591 divided by two because there's two electrons plug involved here and times the log of the, the Q, um, which is uh, one to the negative fourth. And if you do that, you have your equation set up. I've got it down here, zero minus 0 0.591 divided by two times the log of this over one. We've got our anion over the one, that's why this is just what it is because it's divided by one, is equal to 0 0.118. In general though, what we really use this for is more um, individual where you have the two different things happening. Uh, you want one type of element on one side, one on the other. And so you've if you were to have nickel and silver, for example, what you could do is you could evaluate, well, which one is the cathode, which one is the anode, by looking at those standard reduction potentials, okay? And so if we were to really look at this, I'm going to go back and kind of copy the thing that I've got up here. There it goes, where we can just kind of change this over, control C. Here? No, here. The difference is here,
it's not going to necessarily be copper and silver we would look at those potentials and because oh, do I have them written down not really so we could look and we would see silver is here with the point eight um, and then the other one is nickel two plus there it is uh, nickel two plus is negative point two three and because of that what it would really tell us is the fact that um, nickel is going to be more negative we want to have an overall positive um, cell potential you know just saying these words over and over I'm getting tongue-tied because nickel is more negative it has to be the anode it's the only way to get a more positive value okay and so nickel would be over here silver would be over here and it's just going to um, be a very similar setup in general we could also plug in because we've got our uh, concentrations we could plug in oops what we've got come on and just showing you the math 1.03 well where does this come from this comes from cathode minus anode silver is our cathode so it's the point 0.8 wherever the point 0.8 is point 0.8 minus this negative point zero point two three calculator point eight minus um, minus a negative point two three where's my negative there it is oops nope no it should well okay look minus a negative it's 0 0.8 plus 0.23 it comes out to 0 0.1 1.03 I don't know why it's not working but whatever um, and so because we know our anode or cathode we can go ahead and plug in we have our concentrations of what is the cathode what is the anode so we have our 1 over 1 and we can just plug it in to get our um, our, our thing because log of 1 is 0 it ends up being the same here okay so the most important part of this is really this is what we use for batteries how do we know what battery to use how do we know the amount of energy we're going to get from a battery how do you know all kinds of things and it really comes down to when you're converting chemical energy to electrical energy you want to have the most possible and so inside a battery you're not going to have one side that's cathode one side that's anode that would be really inefficient you're only going to have one section one interface where electrons are transferring instead what they do is they have a bunch of tiny little reservoirs and these all of these little interfaces can react simultaneously so you end up getting a bigger transfer of, of electrons a bigger transfer of electricity than overall and so you can end up having you know a D cell battery like this where you've got you know your positive your negative um, anode is the lit the lead f you have cathode with um, uh, lead oxide would be reduced back to lead that kind of thing oh by the way uh, battery acid they always talk about battery acid and if you've ever heard that you've got to be careful with batteries if they are compromised it's because you have sulfuric acid sulfuric acid is pretty nasty stuff you don't want to get that on you if you do you wash your hands immediately because it's highly highly corrosive and so anytime a battery is you know <sighs> compromised I don't, I don't want to say busted because that's not how a good description but if a battery is compromised you need to handle it with care and then dispose of it wash your hands everything really well 
Dry cell batteries, same type of thing. You want to have as much interface between the cathode and the anode as possible. I'm not expecting you guys to memorize what the anode and cathode are, just, you know, and just want you to see. Instead of having one interface, you have this entire long section where you have a transfer of electrons that's possible. Mercury batteries, same thing. Um, you've got a nice large interface here and you can end up getting a good transfer. Now, um, it ends up being really kind of efficient to have this transfer. Let me see if I can figure out a better way to say this. Um, when you want to return metals to their native state, their, their reduced state, um, generally you're going to try and get them back to their original form and whether that's by oxidation or purification that's how you do it. Now we have a big problem here. A lot of metals want to be oxidized. They want to lose those electrons. They want to become positively charged. That's what metals are. They're not electronegative. They want to give up those electrons. So what happens is if you have a pipe, here it's an iron pipe, but it could be copper pipes just like in your house. What ends up happening is over time their exposure to water, they become oxidized um, into rust, iron oxide is rust, and you end up getting a hole in your pipe. That stinks. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars to replace pipes in your house. You're talking flooding, which destroys, you know, your belongings. It's a problem. And so what typically happens is now they will galvanize your pipes. Galvanize means you typically coat it with something like zinc, which wants to be oxidized even more. And so as you have this layer of zinc, let's go ahead with uh, draw. You have this layer of zinc. Even if iron is exposed, because zinc wants to oxidize so much more, it'll take the zinc rather than the iron, your pipes end up lasting a lot longer. They do the same thing with ships. Um, if you think about, um, you know, all the boats in the ocean, they have an iron hull. Iron wants to be oxidized. It wants to rust. You get a hole in your boat, the boat sinks. That's bad. I mean, that's bad. So what they'll do is if you've ever watched, you know, Deadliest Catch or, you know, something like that, they sometimes will show you. Um, there's usually a sacrificial metal, a big chunk of it, down here somewhere. And what happens is even though the ocean is touching all of this, it will selectively take the sacrificial zinc because it is preferred. And so even though you will have to do, you know, re hull repairs every year, it's not nearly the same as if you did not spend a little bit on this sacrificial metal, okay? And so it ends up being beneficial to galvanize pipes, have a sacrificial metal, and so on. And so you can do also coatings like paint um, or you can do, you know, even like a plastic type thing over it. The idea is any type of protection over that metal is going to protect it, okay? Another thing you can do is alloys. You can take something like copper, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant to say, something like iron and add some uh, carbon to it. You end up getting steel that's both harder than regular iron and more resistant to rusting. And so things like um, rebar, when they build bridges and roads, tends to be a little bit more resilient. It's not going to rust quite as fast, although it does still rust. It's just uh, not as fast. The other thing here is it allows for fewer repairs. It ends up saving money. Um, if you think back, golly, it's been like five years now. Um, if you think back to maybe 2012. It hasn't been that long ago. Um, there was this bridge in Northern America. Cars were driving across it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to draw a tire with this. It's not working. Um, cars were driving across it. 
the bridge basically collapsed. This car fell on the cars that were down here. A lot of people died in that. And um, that incited a bunch of research from the government about uh, bridge stability. And they found out there's, you know, something like several million bridges in the U.S. that are in worse shape than the one that actually collapsed. And so the way they're combating that, because it costs billions upon billions of dollars to fix those bridges, is they are trying to come up with ways to protect the metals that are there. And so now when they're building these things, they use alloys, they use, you know, galvanized things, they, they use whatever they can to really make things last. The other thing that you can do is cathodic pr protection. This is the one I actually know the least about. But what you end up doing is you take um, the, ca the, the pipe to protect it, you have something down here, a better oxidizer, something that wants to be oxidized more than the pipe. And it will allow for this pipe to not be oxidized. It's going to continually donate electrons back. And so it preserves the metal the same type of way. Now, in general, if we wanted to, we could force a current through a cell to get a potential that's even though a potential is negative. Generally, electrons flow toward when it's positive, but you can force the issue if you really wanted to. It's a matter of, um, it's just not easy. Consider your cell phone battery. Typically, the battery, the electrons flow, the battery, that the electricity that's flowing through the battery powers your cell phone. But when the cell phone battery is dead, you don't throw it away and go buy a new one. You plug it into your charger, the charger forces the electrons back the other way, so you now have a full charge again. It's the same thing here. And so really what you want to do is find out, well, how much can we get in time? Um, there's a new commercial now about like the, the Bose uh, wireless headphones. They have, um, I think there's, it's supposed to maintain a three hour charge with a five minute charge. Three hour three hour of use for after a five minute charge. Now most of you know that depending on the charger you have for like your phone or your computer, it takes a different amount of time to charge that battery. If you can get a quick charge, a quick charge charger? Hmm, I don't know. Or a charger that might take a little bit more time. Generally, you know, it's it's a matter of how much charge can go through that cur that wire for that period of time. And so you look at the current and time and the quantity of the charge and you can really consider um, what's going to be happening here. And so what you do is you take the columns of charge, which is equal to amps in columns per second, and then you multiply by second. That's going to give you the quantity of your charge. If you multiply by moles, you end up getting, um, you know, one mole of electrons gives you 96,485 columns other way around is how we used it in the Nernst equation. So an unknown metal is electrolyzed. It took 52.8 seconds for a current of 2 amps to plate 0 0.0719 grams. What's the metal? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in to find the moles of metal and then to get the molar mass, we're going to take grams divided by the moles we get. If we go back, we can find the overall. And so what you're going to do is you're going to take the time, 52.8 seconds, times the two columns per second, times, um, and because we have three electrons here, metal has a three plus charge, you're going to end up having um, one mole of electrons per 96485, and then you're going to have, again, three moles total. Okay? If we plug all that in, oh, look, it's here. 52.8 times 2 times 1 over the columns per electron times the 3, 1 over 3 electrons. This is your moles. Grams divided by moles gives you molar mass go to your periodic table and you end up getting your uh, gold, okay? We could do the same thing here where we look at lead, copper, tin, nickel, and zinc. What's the order that they're going to plate? 
Well, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to look to see the most um, positive because that's going to happen first and then further down you're going to go from most positive to most negative and so we can kind of look through and we can see okay well here's our copper it's positive so I bet copper happens first 10 lead there's no is that lead 2 plus then there is lead go down a little bit more there's 10 then nickel and zinc is way down there so if I had to guess, I would say that it's going to be copper. Oh, oops. Followed by lead, followed by tin, nickel, and zinc. Because we're going to be reducing, we're going to be forming metal, we're going to be on the cathode. It's being reduced here. Okay. So we could look at applying this to all kinds of things. I'm not going to get into the processes a whole lot, but the idea is we could look at how to purify metals. How do you produce aluminum? How do you use a battery? How do you produce some of the, um, the solutions you have in lab? It's all a matter of uh, really just taking advantage of electrochemical energy and applying it in some way. And so we could talk about the production of aluminum. I don't really think this is important other than the fact that we can really force something that doesn't want to happen to occur. Okay. We could also electroplate a spoon. You know, if silver doesn't want to um, plate, it would rather be oxidized. But you can plug into a power source and force it to become, to be reduced. Okay. Same thing for sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, make that. You can do all kinds of different things. It's all in how you manipulate the electrochemical energy. Try not to get overwhelmed with the terms. You will need to balance redox reactions here. You will need to solve for the E of a cell. You'll need to figure out from, an, from a table of potentials what's your anode, what is your cathode. Um, you'll probably have one question on the Nernst equation uh, and you know I think maybe one on galvanizing so but that should um, really give you a good idea of where we stand so